Hello, everyone. I am Christy Pagel on behalf of the GPS Dairy Consulting team here with my colleagues, Paul Dyke and Rob Bender. We welcome you to our breakout session here this afternoon and are looking forward to sharing with you systems to turn your feed center into a profit center. So we hope you enjoyed the keynote um, kickoff session um, that um, Mike North moderated and what a great way to kick off the virtual conference for Dairy Strong in 2021. And so we're gonna keep that theme and that motto going at GPS. Um, it is our brand promise that we will continue to um, insert change and grow leaders, which is a great lead into our session this afternoon. I'm going to be doing the moderating and want to encourage you to um, add questions to the um, feed. If you're new to um, this session, I want to um, have you just, I will put it into the feed, but you'll go over to the navigation bar, click on agenda, select our session, and then the question bottom at the bottom of the session box. I will see those questions and after Rob and Paul are finished um, sharing a bit about um, how to turn your feed center into a profit center, I will um, uh, allow time to ask those questions and answers. So without further ado, um, let's turn things over to, uh, to Paul and um, it is all yours, Paul. Hey, thanks, Christy. Uh, thank you to DBA for allowing us to present this year at the virtual conference. It's a, it's a pleasure to be here. Our, you know, we're going to talk a little bit about the feed center today. Often we think about our feed center as an expense center, but we want to kind of turn that around and say, what would it be like if it was a profit center? Something where we don't look at it just as expenses, but as way we can make money in that center. So in order to do that, let's take a look at maybe a, a couple other places on our dairy that we do a pretty good job. And specifically, let's think about what we've done in our parlor. Think about what we did. We do in our parlor, all the protocols we have. The, we, we can measure so many things like the efficiencies per cow or per stall. We know what our costs are per head per day. We know what our labor costs are per hundred weight. We can know how much milk is harvested every hour. We know how many grams a tea dip goes on to each tea, each tea, each milking. It's uh, it's an amazingly efficient part of our dairy where all the metrics are well defined. Now, when we kind of turn our focus on our feed center, that feed system, it's it's a little less defined. We don't quite have all those metrics, and that's what we want to talk about. How can we get better? How can we take charge, take ownership of that feed center to get more out of it, to to, uh, to really take control? So let's think about let's let's kind of tackle this. Let's talk a little bit about where we are today some things where we'd like to go, uh, questions that we wanna get answered. And then we're gonna spend the majority of our time talking about how we get there. The, the X's and O's of how do we approach, approach the feed center and get more out of it on a day-to-day -day basis. So where are we at on the feed center today? If you think about it, we've done a lot of things in the last 10 or 20 years. We've got Diamond V out there. They've done a great job being a leader of TMR audits, a lot of process control. Um, really making our diets more consistent. Kudos to them for doing that. If you take a look at what we've done on the feed software, a little less defined. Uh, we've got some great companies out there, but those haven't been fully implemented and the data not fully used. Think about what we've done on forage quality. We've done a great job in covering bunkers. Uh, we know exactly when we should harvest the alfalfa if it doesn't rain. Um, great job there. Think about kernel processing. Even the last 10 years, uh, we don't really talk about, hey, you know, the corn sides, the, the corn is in process, right? On the whole, we've, we're getting those things down pretty well. But there's probably some areas of opportunity. And I want to just ask a few questions, and these aren't all the questions, but just a few questions to kind of get the discussion going. A simple one that I like is, what is the price to load and deliver one load of feed? It's a pretty simple question, right? Just like a parlor, what's it cost to harvest a hundred weight of milk? We, we, we know that answer, but on the feed center, not so much. Is it $5 a ton, $10 a ton? How much is it per pound of dry matter? We really don't have those answers on almost any dairy. 
And then how does that match to the industry standards? Um, it's hard to find those standards. There's only a couple places, a little bit of info in New York, but beyond that, very few standardized answers to those questions. What's the shrink of each ingredient? We can probably tell you some of those answers. Some of us are doing a good job on with our software in terms of you know, things getting scaled in, scaled out. But do we do that with all our feed? Do we have a, a shrink number at the end of the year, especially for ingredients that are higher priced? Then we can even get a little more analytical, right? What standard deviation of starch in a, in a bunker silage? That's pretty deep. That's pretty, uh, that's pretty technical. If it was a parlor though, we'd have that answer, right? What are the feed costs per pound of dry matter after shrink? We do a great job looking at the ration, looking what's there, but does that include everything? Does it include the shrink from all our commodities and our forages? And how does that compare to last year and how does that compare to industry standards? For a thousand cow dairy, this can mean real dollars. If you think about it, reducing shrink by 3% 3 on a $6 ration, well, that might actually be pretty good compared to where feed prices have gone in the last few months, about 65000 a year. Think about eliminating binders and rations. They certainly have their place, but if we can eliminate those because we do a better on better job on forage quality, around 55000 a year. Ingredient sampling and TMR accuracy, this is the one I, I like a lot. Think about what if your nutritionist could lower his crude protein percent by about a half a percent in a diet. Everything was tight, tighter, everything was more consistent. All the gluten feed, canola, bean meal was, was measured more accurately. Could we reduce our crude protein by half a percent and see no difference in performance? Maybe, 40,000 a year. What about, what about personnel? Can we reduce our injuries? 40,000 a year for every medically consulted injury. Is there room to improve there? Probably. And there's more, of course, labor efficiency, trim labor costs, if we know what they are for the feed center, feed center design efficiencies, stationary mixers versus dry-by mixers, all kinds of ways that we can look at this. But there is profit and there's profit to be made in this feed center. The question perhaps is not so much, is there a profit to be made, but how we, do we do this? How do we tackle this 800 pound gorilla you see he's got some fruit in his hands, but um, I, I think this is the challenge. It can be so overwhelming. How do, we, how do we take this entire feed system and parcel it out and, and tackle one thing at a time? All right, thanks, Paul. Uh, so Paul did a really good job of giving an a overview of where we've been in the industry related to feeding management and where we want to go. What is the desired outcome of, of feeding management? What are some high level questions to ask, right? He laid that out. I want to talk a little bit about the how. How are we going to get there? How are we going to implement the processes to better understand and answer some of those questions? So as part of this effort, uh, GPS Dairy Consulting has launched a, a collection of resources that we call Feed Fit, okay? And it's a program, so the Feed Fit program is really an acronym where the FIT portion of it stands for uh, financials and feed costs, uh, inventory management, and tracking and monitoring. So it's really designed to take a step back and say, okay, uh, our dairies spend millions and millions of dollars every single year on feed. It's likely the highest variable cost on your dairies. What do we need to do to better understand the feed center? What do we need to do to better understand the processes in place so that we can create more rigor and accountability in the feed center? So FeedFit is the name of the program. Um, let's talk a little bit about overview and objectives of the program. So. The first one is really that it's a collaborative initiative and it seeks to leverage a uh, different collection of resources from around the industry and some that we uh, create internally. And it also seeks to get teammates and advisors at the dairy that might be owners, feed managers, the feeders themselves and, and nutritionists perhaps, uh, to work together to increase the efficiency and the in, improve management of the feed center. And really some of the goals here are to better understand the financials, uh, better track inventories, and track KPIs of the feed center. Let's create a list of key performance indicators to measure success on the dairies. Um, now, as, as you well know, there's a lot of different areas at the dairy uh, related to feeding management that you can tap into. So we've 
uh, divided this up into module-based areas in order to guide focus uh, to prevent straying off into different directions. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about the modules that exist. And the ultimate goal here is to really uh, strive to achieve operational excellence uh, in the feed centers at our dairies. So we talk a lot about operational excellence in other areas of the dairy. We talk about it related to cow health. We talk about it related to parlor efficiency. But I think it's time to apply those same standards to the feed center so we can improve performance. And as the title of the presentation would, su would suggest, the ultimate goal here is really to turn your feed center into a profit center. And when we think about profit, a lot of times we think about the income side of the equation, uh, milk production, et cetera. But we really need to think about the feed center so that we can better manage the expense end of the equation and uh, really help our dairies turn a better profit. So uh, as we dig into the program, I wanna talk about the nine modules that are all involved in the program. And in the interest of time today, we certainly don't have time to go into all nine in detail, um, but we're gonna spend a little bit of time going in depth on three of the nine modules. And these are feeding software, loading and mixing, and feeder training. In addition, we'll give you a brief introduction to the other six modules as a bit of a sneak preview on what they entail and what it involves uh, so that we can follow up at a later date if you want more information. Uh, these six modules are feed fit tracking, feed costs and budgets, feed center design, clean feed, forage quality, and feed lean. And really when we look at the whole feed center, we tried our best to divide it logically into these nine areas to better guide our focus and attention. So uh, based on these nine modules, let's talk a little bit about the blueprint that's in place uh, to implement some of these systems on a dairy. Okay, so this is the process that we would go about doing. The very first step, step would be a self-assessment of the current feed center. So this means you get your whole feed team together. Usually, again, that's the owner, the feed manager, the feeder uh, himself or herself, as, as well as the nutritionist often. And you do an assessment of those nine modules and you figure out where is the biggest area of opportunity for our dairy? Where can we achieve success if we spend time and focus? Once we know what that area is, we jump to the second step, which is understanding capabilities and the growing opportunities at the dairy. So what this really means is, where do we have resources at the dairy to make necessary improvements? Meaning, we might have the lowest hanging fruit in one of the modules, but if we don't have the resources at the dairy to commit to uh, improving that area, it really doesn't pay to spend time on it right now. So it's really an evaluation of what the capabilities are on your individual dairy to determine the highest likelihood of success. Uh, once we do that, uh, we work together as a team to uh, form a strategic blueprint uh, as a guiding post in implementing the procedure. And quickly behind that is the execution phase. And this is really implementation and execution. And as we know on any system at a dairy, um, there is a fair bit of iteration that might be involved. Meaning if we start to implement a process around wayback management and we realize uh, for some reason uh, the practical implications of it, it's not working at the dairy, we maybe need to change some things up, change the process or procedure um, and do a little bit of an iter iterative process to uh, achieve success. So that's the implementation phase. And then the very last one is, is one that's really laced throughout this whole blueprint and that's people development. As part of the people development approach, frequently we're having conversations uh, around coaching. We're having consulting conversations. Sometimes it's facilitating team meetings. Sometimes it's training and development. But really, uh, we all know that the people component to our dairies is of absolute importance. And we need to start there and end there. Uh, we need to elevate the people at our dairies and in particular in our feed center. And that brings us back to our brand promise at GPS, which is really uh, transcends this whole program. And that's to inspire change and grow leaders. We want to inspire changes in the process of feeding manage at your, management at your dairies and help grow leaders, grow the people involved in the process. So that's the blueprint uh, involved with the program. So uh, we want to jump into those three modules as uh, key focus areas for today. And then we'll briefly outline those other six modules uh, just uh, real briefly as a, a sneak preview. 
So the first one is loading and mixing. All right, so when you think of loading and mixing module, uh, the one thing, the most important piece of equipment that comes to mind is your mixer, right? And that's really where this whole module starts, okay? So as a module overview, I wanna talk about the number one goal of this module, and that's, and that's really to continuously provide a fresh, high quality, well-mixed and non-sorted ration across the entirety of the feed bunk. There's a lot of words there. Uh, and when you break it down, it doesn't sound like it's that difficult to do, but there's a lot of components to it that we need to focus on in order to achieve success. So as part of the program, we have a number of key module resources that we use to uh, dig in and evaluate the performance and improve a process at the dairy. Uh, first one is a TMR audit. Second one is a mixer audit. And the third one is an internal resource to GPS called a feeding data review that we use for our clients. And here's the key focus areas related to this module. It's uh, first about mixer maintenance and performance. We wanna make sure that the most or uh, one of the most important pieces of equipment on our dairies, the mixer, is performing at a very high level with a uh, very high level of scale accuracy, and good synchrony between uh, different programs, software programs at the dairy. Uh, we also wanna understand the protocols that are in place at the dairy so that uh, if we need to make changes, we can. So let me give you an example. I wanna talk about wayback versus refusal for a second. A lot of times these terms are used interchangeably in the industry, but we actually use this as a teaching point for the dairies we work for. We think there's a difference between wayback and refusal. Wayback is something that is left in the feed bunk at the end of the day or the next morning, and the feed is of sufficient quality to be used as an ingredient in another diet, okay? It's an ingredient in another diet. In contrast, refusal is something that cows refuse to eat, okay? It's the sticks, the stones, the long straw particles, it's the stuff that's sorted through, etc. So we think by teaching feeders that, or teaching the people that are scraping out bunks in the morning, we can help them better understand how important it is to prevent sorting and those kind of things at a dairy. We also work through uh, calling bunks as a protocol, okay? So we wanna understand how feeders call bunks. Do they do it on a dry matter basis or do they make adjustments on an as-fed basis? Is it on a per head basis or is it on a per pen basis at the farm? That's the second key focus area. And uh, lastly, the other key focus area is really related to TMR loading. This is things like ingredient order, delivery of feed and the drop times associated with it. It's ingredient deviation, it's the accuracy of the mixer and, and components going into the feed, like going into the mixer like liquid for instance and evaluating particle length to make sure uh, the system is set up appropriately. All right, so let's uh, dig in uh, to these key resources. First one is the TMR audit, and I'm not gonna spend a ton of time uh, here because it's really a resource that isn't necessarily new to the industry uh, in that Diamond V has done this for a long, long time in the industry and is really a trusted partner in this process. They've done a phenomenal job bringing this program out to the industry for a number of years. Really, it's about looking at consistency of the feed bunk across the whole uh, feed drop from that mixer. You'll see samples numbered one through 10, representing the first bit of feed that comes out and the last feed that comes out as number 10. And you're looking at the consistency when the feed is shaken down with a Penn State shaker box. Uh, and we measure consistency using a coefficient of variation, a CV. Uh, so percent coefficient of variation is a relative measure of variation among this set of variables. The goal of the TMR audit is consistency in every bite for every cow every single day. All right. Uh, let's move to the next resource because it really builds off of this one. And this resource is called a mixer audit. Now the mixer audit is, as it would suggest, is focused 100% on the mixer itself, okay? So this is also done in partnership with Diamond V. GPS actually uh, worked closely with Diamond V to tweak the TMR audit a little bit to look just at the mixer, 100% around mixer performance, okay? And just to take a step back here, let's think again about the millions of dollars of feed that go through your mixers every year. Do you have a mixer maintenance schedule at your dairy? Do you have somebody personally dedicated to grease the mixer periodically to look at 
um, screws and make sure they're timed correctly, to look at auger wear or levelness of the mixer. How often are you evaluating those kind of criteria on your mixer? Do you have that maintenance schedule? That's really what this is all about. The second key area here would be more around scale accuracy, calibration, and software integration. Now, a number of your dairies likely have a drive over scale on your farm, and I would highly suggest that you use that scale as a resource in order to check scale accuracy relative to your mixer. Uh, we suggest that it should be plus or minus 1% of the load weight, um, and it should be plus or minus 20 pounds of the scale head display when you're checking individual load cells. Uh, we encourage you to check it when it's full and when the wagon is empty and to check it at least monthly. It's actually not that hard to do and it gives you some really key information. All right, that's the second part of the mixer audit. The last part is safety. And, um, you know, this is an area that, to be honest, I think our industry needs to raise the bar on. I think we can do a better job around safety on our dairies and in particular the feed center. Uh, looking at the equipment, I still occasionally see uh, PTO shields that aren't in place. I see cab steps that are uh, broken or uh, ready to fall apart. Occasionally ladders that uh, aren't functional. Um, I see poor work lighting at times. Um, you know, I, I do see increasingly a lot more people wearing high-vis clothing as a protocol on the dairy, which is really encouraging. So it's really about looking at safety in relative to the mixer in the whole feed center. And the, what I would just comment on here is uh, safety becomes a culture issue at a dairy. If you want a culture of high level of safety, it needs to start with the ownership at the farm, work its way down to mid-level managers, and then work its way further down to the employees at the farm. All right, so that's the mixer audit. Uh, the third resource in uh, the loading and mixing module is the feeding data review. Okay. Uh, feeding data review is a resource that's internal to GPS as an offering to our clients. And it basically takes a backup from your feeding software. And we compile a series of reports that are designed to be user friendly. Um, that's over a set period of time. So oftentimes we'll look at a three month interval when we do an evaluation. Um, sometimes it'll be longer or shorter depending on the focus area. Um, we typically do them on an annual basis sometimes more often depending on the changes or uh, programs we're implementing on the farm. We can do this on any of the main uh, five feeding software companies in the industry. Uh, these are FeedWatch, EasyFeed, TMR Tracker, Feed Supervisor, and OneFeed. So we regularly do them with each of the programs. And it really allows another set of eyes from a consultant on our team that is personally dedicating dedicated to evaluating feeding software. So if I'm the nutritionist on a dairy, I might have input into creation of the report, but we actually have somebody on our team uh, that is involved in creating these and dedicated to putting these reports together. They're designed to be comprehensive and really easy to understand so that when we're having discussions, uh, feeders can really understand the data and understand what's going on so that it can lead to uh, accountability and lead to some uh, positive changes at the dairy. So let me show you a couple examples because I think this is a really good tool that dairies can continue to use. Uh, first one is feed, uh, first feeding time at the dairy, okay? So on this graph, we're looking at a time interval from the beginning of May through the end of, or through the middle of August, okay? Roughly a three month time interval. And you see different colors represented here to note the different pens at this particular farm. And what we're looking at is the consistency of feed delivery every single day uh, for this three month time span. We set the goal that feeders uh, should be able to be within 20 minutes roughly on a daily basis of the day before. And we believe that that kind of consistency is, is uh, really important to the dairy and really important to the cows so that bunks don't run out of feed and cows get good dry matter intakes. At the same time, limiting the amount of refusals or waybacks um, so that we don't have excess feed feed expense tied up in uh, way back management. So you can see on this graph, feeding is relatively consistent through the course of this three month period, but there's an occasional time where they might be a little bit more than 20 minutes off. Typically when we show this kind of graph in a team meeting atmosphere with the feeders, a lot of times they'll point to that, that dot on the graph and they'll say, you know, I know exactly what happened that day. It was because the parlor was behind and uh, the gates on the cross alley were closed and I just couldn't feed on time. So then it'll lead to a discussion around how do we keep the parlor on time? 
or you know maybe the mixer broke down that day something like that that um, may not be the feeder's fault necessarily but it actually affected the cows so we want to get more consistent okay next graph um, is uh, refusal percent on this pen okay so same sort of graph same time interval we're looking at the same five pens of cows actually uh, but we're looking at refusal percent or wayback percent if you will Couple things you notice in this particular graph, you notice that instead of the five colors, we actually only see one color represented. Well, that's an interesting note. On this particular dairy, we discover that Wayback is only being entered on one of the five pens. It's not entered on all five pens, okay? That's an area of opportunity to figure out exactly what cows are eating and how much is left over the, the, the next day. The other thing we really notice is that at the beginning or towards the middle of May, there's about a three week interval where Wayback isn't entered at all. And uh, you could say, well, maybe cows are out of feed every single day and it's actually zero. But actually what was happening here is the feeder was not entering in Wayback for some reason. Uh, so we were not getting accurate data around dry matter intakes. Uh, so it led to really good discussions. Um, and after that point, the feeders started implementing, uh, you know, the program and the suggestion changes. And now we have better data at this theory. But it, it really started out with that team meeting and that, it, that interaction among the feeder. All right. So uh, next slide. There's one more slide I want to show you. This is sort of everybody's favorite when we're talking about feeding management, right? This is ingredient deviation by feeder. And this is sort of the holding the feeder accountable kind of chart. What we're looking at here is... Uh, ingredient deviation by month uh, by ingredient. So each column uh, you can see is representing a month, May, June, July, and half of August. And then each line represents one of the feedstuffs that's used at the dairy. And underneath each month, you'll see an as-fed deviation or a dry matter deviation that's representing the average loading the average ingredient deviation of the loading action summarized over the entire month, okay? When that individual loading deviation exceeds 30 pounds dry matter, it's highlighted in red on this graph. So it's designed on this chart. It's designed to be a really visual way for a feeder to look and say, how am I doing? And as you can see on this chart, there's quite a bit of opportunity uh, for this individual feeder. He or she exceeds uh, 30 pounds dry matter deviation on quite a few of these ingredients on a fairly regular basis. Uh, typically what we find is, um, you know, it is due to a feeder accuracy issue and we might ask the feeder to slow down a little bit, but actually sometimes there's other things going on. Sometimes there's a, a uh, equipment malfunction or a software malfunction. It's not necessarily the fault of the feeder, but it leads to really good conversations. So that, that concludes uh, the loading and mixing module, but I just wanted to give you a flavor for what that module entails. So I'm going to turn it over to Paul now, and he's going to uh, preview the next module. So the feeding software module, of course, dovetails into a lot of other modules, but we really wanted to set this module apart because we think it's a, a key opportunity on most dairies. Most dairies, um, when we're thinking about software on the dairy side we're thinking about herd management software one of the three that you all know and, and you're kind of like well that's great but what about that other program on the computer and it doesn't get the attention that it deserves so one of the first things that we did when we um, started thinking about this was we approached those five companies and said look we really would like to have um our dairies, our clients, and yourselves, a support and pledge. We want to have a common agreement as to our expectations for how this should work on a dairy. We, we think there's opportunities to grow. So the first part of this, of course, is we need to expect more from our feed software, more from our feed software companies. It's not just good enough that, hey, the cows got fed today. What other things are in those so in that software that can help us to be more profitable. So part of the, the as, as we've gone through this, is, is the discovery that there's also there's always this question of who's responsible for what. Some of these are really simple, right? Dry matters, it's probably the feeders that's going to put those dry matters in that software every day. But what about maintaining prices and inventories? Who's actually responsible for that? What about weekly reports back to the managers? Who's looking at that data? And how, how do we parse that out? So as we've kind of met with some dairies, our clients, and we've said, hey, let's talk about the software. We found out it's not just the feeder, it's not just the manager, 
It's the team that has to have a discussion. So part of this, of course, is to engage your software provider. Um, I've always, I find the question interesting to ask of our clients and say, who's your software provider and who's the rep that you talk to? Is there somebody that's providing support for you? How often do you see them? How often do you engage with them? And for me, it, it becomes, it comes down to, are you being proactive or reactive on your software? Are, are you saying, hey, what else can I, can I do with the software? What else can I get out of it? Or do I only look at that software when I'm reacting to that? You know, when am I training my feeders and especially the weekend backup feeders? Do they know how to run the software? Those, those folks need to know. Other questions that I ask when we, we think about software is, you know, what are your expectations on the farm? Do you want something that's mobile? What about something that's interactive? Does it play nice with other software? And this is questions that I think you can ask your software provider to giving you everything that you need. And sometimes there's capabilities that it has, like the cloud-based options on some that you didn't even know existed. So again, it's about, it's about a discovery and then trying to get more out of it. So what are some things that might be missing on the feed software side? So I think the one, an easy one for a lot of farms is, are we scaling all the trucks coming in? Yeah, we scale a lot of trucks for commodities like gluten feed and corn coming in, but are we scaling it for all the corn sage and haylage that's coming into the farm as well? Have we automated those scales? Um, are we including all these weights in our feed software so we can track inventory? If we have everything scaled in and we scale everything coming out with the software, now we're getting at shrink. Now we can make some meaningful decisions in terms of um, shrink in terms of our corn such. What, what's that actually look like? If we're bringing cotton seed in, is the shrink 2% or is it 20% on your dairy? It's an important question. For prices, um, I think there's, it, it gets to be complicated because it's about responsibility. A lot of times for this software, we need to bring in a third person. It might be an office staff member who says, I, I need to be the one putting these prices in. And what prices do you use? Do you use contract prices, price for every load? Or is there uh, something in between that you wanna use? Uh, we're gonna use the average cost of bean meal for the week and that's the price we're gonna put in on Monday. These are good discussions, but probably discussions that need to be had so it can be done consistently. We're trying to get our get to the point where we have consistent and trusted data. So how might we apply this? And I wanna just give you one example and uh, give you an idea how this how, how software can be used well. So if we will look at the light left here, we can see these are pre-fresh pens. Some were intakes are somewhere between 25 and 35 pounds of intake. One pen is obviously some, some heifers that are on the pre-fresh diet, really quite consistent and it's looking like things are moving along quite well all the way through September and October. And then at the end of October, there's some haps. You can all of a sudden start seeing variability. You can start seeing the intakes of those pens kind of go up and down, and you can kind of see the prefresh pen and the, the pre, excuse me, the prefresh intakes are actually starting to creep down. And we kind of know what the answer for that is. They removed water. Right, they removed water on this dairy and it was getting cold and they didn't have the system set in place. Um, and that's fine, but there are some more additional questions. When it came to the end of October, I I'm hoping everybody noticed it was inconsistent, but who's watching it after that? Is the feeder watching those intakes? Does management know that there's something off? Does anybody know that this is happening? Who's responsible for looking at this data on a weekly basis, on a daily basis? And that's where coaching comes in. That's where training comes in with both our management and our feeders. And that kind of uh, leads us to one more example. I'm sorry, second example. And this would be a graph from Easy Feed. We have these on one feed as well. And I really like these graphs because it kind of gives us an insight into what the feeder is actually doing. This of course is a graph of feed being loaded and unloaded. On the left side, you can see the green bars going up. Every time they put a bucket feed in there, the green bar kind of jumps. Now, if you kind of look at the bottom example, the bottom red circle, you can see that there's something interesting that happened. When the feeder was adding the milk push out, uh, way backs on this farm, they, uh, they, you can notice that they got to their weight, corn silage, showed up on it popped over corn silage came up and all of a sudden within a few seconds 20 seconds more cor corn silage arrives in that mixer 
So what's happening here is the mixer's going in, he's putting milk push out into the TMR mixer, and then all of a sudden it pops over and instead of instead of going to the corn silage pile for more corn silage and put he just dumps the rest of his bucket into that mixer. And the same thing happens for the corn silage. You can kind of see he's putting corn silage in, corn silage in, and then it pops over, he gets what he needs, and it pops over to the robot premix. Instead of going and bringing that corn silage away, he just tips his bucket, puts the rest of the corn silage in, and away we go. It's a whole lot faster and easier for the feeder, but that is not accurate. So of course, this is a, a place where we have some coaching opportunities, you might say. Uh, I sit down with the feeder and say, yep, we know what's going on, we can't do this. So that's, uh, that's why software can be used, but you actually have to look at the data, look at the software to see where there might be opportunities. So if we think about this, um, we think about our software, it does come down again to a commitment to excellence from the management to the feeder level. Is everybody committed to that software? What happens when somebody forgets to include refusals? How is everything maintained in that system? What happens when we don't train feeders? And I, I think you have to always come back and say, if we don't pay as much attention to the feed software as we do our herd software, why not? What happens if somebody didn't add calves or breeding dates to your herd software? That would not be acceptable and it shouldn't be acceptable for our feed software either. We, need, we can do better. There's lots of opportunities there. All right, so that kind of leads, of course, to the next part. All right, uh, the third module that I wanted to give you a, a more in-depth look at today is the feeder training module. And you'll notice that throughout the presentation today, we talked a lot about the people involved in the feed center, the, the, the people in management. And that's uh, really what the focus of this module is. And I would just start by asking uh, a question. Um, you know, we talked earlier about the millions and millions of dollars that uh, are going through your mixer every year at your dairies. And based on that, you have an individual or a set of individuals that are involved in feeding management at your dairy. It's a pretty important position, right? So when is the last time your feeder left your dairy to attend a feeder training event or a development event uh, designed for that particular person? Now, I, I think what we often see is that it doesn't happen very often. Um, and so our initiative here is to uh, bring feeder training to the industry as a way to help elevate that position in the industry. And we, we call it master feeder certification. It's really designed to uh, turn feeders into masters of their craft, just like we've done with herd managers and parlor managers, excuse me, uh, as well. We want that commitment to excellence that commitment to operational excellence at the dairy. You see some pictures here. We've done a number of schools over the years, as we call them, uh, and they're designed in the peer group format uh, so that there's a lot of interaction at the dairies. Um, all right, so let me give you a few more details on the program itself. Um, in the past, we've done this at about 20 locations already. Um, and as part of those 20 locations, uh, they've taken place across the upper Midwest, and they've actually taken place uh, internationally, too. We've done them uh, in Germany and Italy and uh, in Australia as well. Uh, so we've, we've helped train feeders uh, in multiple places. Um, and over 200 people have participated. And like I said, it's really a peer group atmosphere so that feeders uh, feel at home interacting with people that are doing the same job they are on a daily basis. Um, the other thing that's really, really important here is that we make sure it's located in the feeder's backyard, and that is at the dairy and at the feed center at the dairy. Feeders are typically very kinesthetic people. They like to work with their hands on a regular basis. And so we believe it's important to, to host the training sessions at the dairy themselves. Um, so again, I show the goal here of the program, and that's really to elevate the position in the industry so that it better aligns with the fiscal impact of feeding management on the dairy. And the last thing I'll say is that uh, you'll see the icon there that says Habla Espanol, and really that's designed so that we, um, probably a majority of our feeders uh, speak Spanish as a primary language, and uh, we wanna make sure we can communicate with them uh, properly, and so we translate the sessions as well uh, to address those needs too. Um, and I wanna show you a couple of resources here that we'll introduce. Uh, when we work with feeders at the dairy. From, from left to right, um, one of them is feed bunk scorecards. Okay, so the concept here is that it's a, 
a little bit more of an objective assessment for a feeder to use when evaluating feed bunks and determine uh, and helpful to use in order to call bunks to determine if cows need to get more feed uh, today or if they can be re reduced in the amount of feed and if feed needs to be pushed in or if feed is adequately distributed across the bunk. All these resources are in Spanish as well. The second one is a visual demonstration. Uh, so we do a lot of these at these feeder schools. Um, uh, again, the reason is because feeders are kinesthetic people, right? Uh, so in this example, it's hard to tell, but we're actually training how to do a dry matter, which seems a little bit elementary until you start talking about weather events related to dry matters on forages, okay? So for instance, what do you do when it snows on your uh, corn silage pile? What do you do when it's a wet snow versus a dry snow? All right, that seems like a crazy concept, but everybody in Wisconsin knows exactly what I'm talking about. Wet snow is a lot wetter and heavier than a dry snow might be, and it influences the feed. All right, next resource is uh, world-class feed management goals. You may have heard about these already, but we put together a list of 11 goals that we believe the top performing dairies in the industry need to meet in order to achieve the best results on the cow end of things and on the feed cost input end of the equation. And then the last resource you see there is a Wayback Evaluation Board where it's just designed to be a highly visual whiteboard that's placed uh, in a location at the dairy where everybody can see it. And the feeder enters in the amount of Waybacks by pen by day. Of course, this information is in the software, but when it's on a board where people can see it, you create a lot more accountability and you help, under, you help milkers understand when things like uh, cows mixed up in pens influences the amount of feed left in a pen, right? So we can help um, other people at the dairy understand what the feeder is looking at as well. So that is really the master feeder certification in its entirety. We've done a lot of schools in the past. We intend to do a lot more going forward here uh, in the very near future. All right, we're gonna shift gears now into these last, uh, excuse me, these last six modules and give you a real quick taste for what they involve. First one is forage quality. This one starts out with the premise that an average thousand cow dairy in Wisconsin produces in excess of a million dollars in forage each year. That's a lot of money. So I would ask, what are your forage quality targets at your dairy? How do you measure success? Um, and what are the bottlenecks in your program? And the very last bullet point there is, is one that I think is of utmost importance. And that is, do you have a pre-harvest meeting for haylage and corn silage at your dairy? We cannot control mother nature, right? Uh, but we can control communication on our farms. And what I overwhelmingly see in the industry is that there is an opportunity to get the uh, forage harvesting team together prior to harvest to make sure we work out any kinks and bottlenecks that are existing in the program. So that is the uh, main goal of the forage quality module. Uh, the second module here is the clean feed module. And as you might expect, it's related to TMR hygiene and the pathogens associated in the, in the TMR. So the goal of this module is really uh, that we look and identify anti-nutritional factors like yeast and molds and mycotoxins to quantify them as they exist on the dairy, but also on the proactive end, figure out uh, um, management strategies to mitigate them and, and reduce the likelihood that they exist on the farm. I, I probably don't need to remind you uh, the impact that mycotoxins have on the cows, and you see that schematic on the bottom that I'm, I'm not going to go through in detail, but certainly uh, mycotoxins affect things like fertility and kidney function and liver health, um, GI health, right? It has a profound impact on the farm, and we want to reduce it as much as possible. That's the goal of the clean feed module. All right, with that, I'm going to turn it over to Paul for an introduction to the last four modules. So last four modules, feed center design module. This is perhaps a module that you might use uh, once in a while, or if you're redesigning your feed center, um, or you want to redo your feed center, um, what you have right now, you might start saying, is there a better way? Is there a better way? Is there a better layout to what I'm doing every day? A lot of um, farms grow into their feed centers, and after a while, it becomes inefficient. One of the simple examples I like to use is, you know, should we stage forages at a stationary mixer or should we go and drive the mixer toward where the corn sodge bunker is? Simple question, but not well answered on most dairies. 
Second module um, I want to talk about is the feed lean module. This borrows from the manufacturing industry, the lean concept. Uh, really what that is about is removing waste in the system. So you're going to look at your entire system decide, what do I not need? How do I remove the Muda? Remove the Muda. You could probably use that as a, as a tagline for a lot of your dairy. How can I become more efficient in every facet and take out what I need? Bottom line on the bottom there is a mixer going around the dairy. Could could there be less travel with that mixer? Maybe there could, and that would that's the goal of this module. Remove the muda. Last two modules: feed costs and budget module. Uh, feed costs and budget modules would seem to be self-explanatory, but it's forecasting into the future and planning for the future. It's amazing how many dairies you know get to the end of the year and you saw how much corn size you do you need for next year. Well, you certainly can look on your software and get an idea of what you used, but are there changes happening? Do you want to change how much acres of corn silage or haylage you're growing for next year? How do we plan that? And in order to have that, you need trusted data. So all your data streams need to be uh, sound, and then you can make plans for the future. So, of course, there's all kinds of software and spreadsheets that you can do that with. And finally, the last module is the it's kind of the final module, right? It's the feed fit tracking module. We start bringing data streams in from our herd software, from our feed software, from our accounting system and say, how can we bring those together in one spot and come up with common KPIs? And can we do that in real time? Can we, can we pull this up at any time on our dairy and say, hey, you know what? My cost per pound of dry matter is currently at you know, 10 and, 10 and a half cents. Last month it was 10 and a half, 10.4 cents. Can you do that? So that's the goal of these modules, a lot more into numbers and really getting into uh, the X's and O's on the dairy for profitability. So that's kind of the, the six modules that we have, um, just a sneak peek into the last four. And uh, we appreciate you spending time with us today. Um, if you want to get hold of us, uh, our phone numbers and emails are, of course, on the screen, and you can Google us as well. Or if you want a little more info about GPS Dairy, just visit us at our website. We have a brand new website that's up and running, a lot of info there that I think you might enjoy. With that, I'm going to turn it over back to Christy, and, and I'm going to stop sharing my screen here in a minute. If Christy, if you want to take it away and maybe uh, bring up some questions that might have come up. Sure, absolutely. And um, thanks, Rob. Thanks, Paul, for um, sharing a bit into the feed fit program that GBS Dairy Consulting is offering. And so um, for those of you that may have um, captured a question as you were listening, I want to encourage you to um, add that into the question feed. And um, I will kick things off here while we have roughly um, about uh, 10 minutes for our Q&A. And so, um, you know, as I listen to the two of you, as I've been a part of kind of the journey that, uh, that you are embarking upon with some of uh, our clients, I really think a lot about the people side of the business and how in critical it is to help them have buy-in to the importance of ongoing learning. And so I would maybe ask you to simply just either share a story or a bit about how you've gained um, the, you know, the acceptance to embark upon the journey of FeedFit and the importance of ongoing development. Sure, I can, uh, I'll start. Yeah, I think to me, the biggest thing is, um, is uh, just starting to, to jump in and work with the feeders themselves. I think oftentimes, uh, too often, we're, we're guilty of uh, perhaps undervaluing the feeder position in the dairy industry. Um, it's a hugely important position and, and we as consultants need to work closely with the dairies and, and the dairy owners and managers do certainly too. We need to work with the feeders and oftentimes what we see is feeders are very uh, linear sequential people typically, right? Uh, they, they put an ingredient in, they go to the next one and they go to the next one, right? They like their day very structured. And so when we're talking about a process, I might have a really good idea or I think it's a really good idea or related to wayback management or something like that. But when we can engage the feeder, um, that individual starts thinking about the program, thinking, starts thinking about his day-to-day -day, uh, job and what it consists of, right? 
And a lot of times they'll come back to me and they'll say, all right, you, you know, that's, that's not going to quite work. We need to change some things around. It's going to help the dairy if we do, you know, X, Y, Z, or, you know, something could be better if we did it this way. And I, I think 95% of the time when we engage with the feeders at the dairy, we discover that they are individuals that want to do, want to do a really good job. They want to grow. Uh, they want to be developed. And uh, if we take that effort, they will respond. We need to empower these uh, individuals at the dairy, particularly uh, because of the responsibility they have. So that's my experience. Yeah, Rob, I would uh, want to add to that. Um, you know, I think when we, we tackle any of these modules or, or say the software module, we might not accomplish everything in one day or one month. It's going to take a little bit of time. If we want folks to put in prices, well, we can implement some of that. But some changes take a little bit of time, you know, in terms of refusals. Well, let's start getting the refusals in. And we come back a month or two and say, all right, maybe it's not all getting done quite the way we'd like it, but get started, get engaged with the feeder and start asking questions and saying, all right, what happened that day? And once, in the, and once you start approaching it as a collaborative effort, as a, as a team effort that we're all in this together, um, we're not watching you. No, we're not. We're not peering over your shoulder. We all want to get better. I think that can the, the feeders want that. They want to be encouraged. They want to get better. So it's once you start engaging the feeders, um, wonderful things can happen. You bet. And um, you know, it is in many ways when you think about the opportunity to be able to help an individual grow. Uh, there's there's a lot of benefit that comes to the dairy, right? Uh, that's tenfold, whether it be, you know, reducing turnover, whether it be them being more efficient in their work. And so it is about kind of that support that's provided along the way. Um, a question that's come in is, are you required to be a GPS customer to get your hands on the FeedFit program? <laughs> yeah, that's a good question. Um, so to date, we've really implemented it uh, on our clients to start with. That's really been the main focus. And uh, that's not to say we're not open to exploring other opportunities for non-clients, um, but really to get the most success out of the program, there needs to be an ongoing relationship with the people that are at the dairy. So, you know, if we were to just approach a feeder that we don't know and say, hey, you know, we're going to we're gonna change all these things on you and we're going to uh, alter a bunch of stuff and he's going to look at us like, uh, who the heck are you guys coming in and and screwing up my life, right? Uh, so we're very interested in, in uh, looking at dairies that are non-clients as well, um, but it, it requires a pretty big commitment on the part of the dairy because there needs to be a relationship built on that whole team. Yeah, you know, I think I heard um, one of the key words in the first uh, session was about alignment in gaining alignment of all of the people that would be involved um, in order to, you know, take that assessment, begin to kind of um, you know, figure out where the opportunities lie within all the different modules that exist and, um, and really, you know, build a relationship. So um, thanks, Rob, for sharing that. Um, you know, Paul, question for you as, as you talked a bit about um, some of the, the specifics um, around, you know, audits and feed lean and forage quality module, how important is it, would you say, to... Um, to have that pre-harvest meeting in order to have success um, throughout an entire season or um, just comment if you would a little bit about the benefits to just that one meeting. I think we've known for a long time that forage quality is a foundation to success on many dairies. And that's good to say and when I a dairy is in control of everything and maybe they have uh, 150 cows and they're the one cutting, chopping and harvesting their forage and covering it. That's great. But as dairies get to be a little bit larger, more players become involved. You know, the, it might be a custom chopper that come involved. You have labor on the farm. You have two brothers, one running the equipment, one running the dairy. What's the expectations for quality? How much feed do we need for the dry cows? How much feed do we need for the heifers? What are we going to allocate where? How are we going to store it? Who's going to cover the bunk? How are we going to get things done? And what's the X's and O's? Just sitting down with a custom harvester and saying, all right, 
when we start on our farm, how are we going to decide what where the rollers are going to be set for the corn silage? I said, hey, we're all good with, you know, we're grind size in that corn, but there's still opportunities. Who makes the call? Who's the one that puts their hand up and says, stop, stop the presses, stop the, the chopper. We've got to, we've got to reset. Who makes that call? If we have a meeting ahead of time, we can delegate that authority. We can decide, charge a what, make everything run smoother. I think part of that is also saying, hey, what went wrong last year? <laughs> what are things that we can improve on? Where are the obstacles? Where are the, where are the potential potholes, even if that hasn't happened? Like, hey, our choppers are getting there. Uh, we need more packing tractors. It's Our density wasn't right. So there's a lot of a lot of details that go into that. So just saying, hey, we, we want to put up high quality forage because we know it's important. That's great, but we get that, that pre-harvest meeting takes us to that next level. And, and Christy, if I could expand on that, because I, I really uh, value the importance of those meetings. And another example I might give is, um, I've, ever, I've actually had dairies where we do a meeting like that, where they'll actually invite the local police department to be part of the meeting. And that might seem counterintuitive, right? Why would you invite the cops to the, to the meeting? But really the point is, uh, uh, this last fall, 2020, typically was pretty good in terms of corn silage harvest with minimal mud and stuff like that on the roads. But the two previous years were really, really rough on dairies. And in turn, it was rough on the community and the people driving on the roads. And so having the police officer there to talk about cleaning roads or traffic patterns or uh, truck, uh, you know, truck driver etiquette, those kind of things when you meet a truck on the road, doesn't seem like a huge deal, right? But those things can make a really, really big difference. Deeries work really long hours during forage harvesting and uh, sometimes tempers get a little short and, uh, you know, people get tired. So it's about preparing in advance for the things that we can control. Certainly. So as we get ready to um, begin to wrap, I want to ask maybe one final question. How, um, when you think about putting a challenge out there to those that are listening today, and um, whether it be about the assessment and taking inventory in many ways of where they are today as it relates to their feed center, what would be one challenge or one goal you would, you would set forth for uh, those that might be listening today? Well, um, I'll, I, I'll start. Uh, I would say the, the number one that comes to mind for me is relating to feeding software. And so Paul, I apologize if I take yours that you're gonna throw out there, but uh, we have a tremendous opportunity on the dairies we work with to use feeding software at a higher level. There's so much that is involved in these programs that we're not even tapping into on the farms. So the things that Paul went over, like price management, cost management, inventory tracking, all those kind of things, we can get more out of that program. We have a long, long ways to go. Paul, you get 10 seconds. Sit down with your feeder, ask them some questions, talk to them. What do they know? What do they do, don't know? Get, how are you going to get your feeder and make them a better feeder this year? Where are they going to go? What what are you going to do to to put them as a make them a world class feeder? What are you going to do with your feeder? Awesome! Thank you both for um, your your time, your talent, and um, really the impact that GPS Dairy Consulting will have on our industry as we continue to move forward in collaboration with many that we're forming alliances with. Kelly, I'm going to turn it back to you, and thanks everyone. GPS Dairy Consulting serves and helps. dairies consistently achieve growth, profit, and success, hence the name GPS Dairy Consulting. Our independent consultants work as an integrated team to bring a unique and broad offering of services and tools to your dairy that will help bring repeatable and consistent results and success. What that means to me is the part that we live every day, and that is to inspire change and grow leaders. 